Hello, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance um, here in Chicago. Uh, we've got Dylan, our operations manager, uh, manning the controls. So he'll be looking at the questions and answers as we go. Um, Chris Ott, our deputy director up in Madison, is actually uh, bringing a tour of Kane County representatives down to Chicago. So he won't be joining us today, um, but we're going to give a great presentation on um, Union Station and the future of high-speed rail for Chicago to those folks in this afternoon. Um, so uh, the basic thing is the chat is free to use, but if you have a specific question, um, please put it in the questions and answers. I will try to keep an eye on it. And if there's something that really needs to be addressed right away to address something, I'll do it. Uh, but probably we'll just do questions and answers. Um, I want to send a, a shout out to Robert Munson. Um, he gets the Train Day Award uh, for giving us a blog yesterday that we posted this morning. Um, you can find that on our, our blog post. So thank you for the... Uh, Robert for making that happen. Um, so uh, we've been around since uh, 1993. And uh, our founding premise at that point was that if, uh, if Paris to Lyon and Madrid to Seville, which are roughly equal to Chicago to St. Louis, um, if they can have frequent trains that do that trip in two hours and 20 minutes, uh, Chicago to St. Louis can have it too. Uh, um, and uh, so that's that's the founding goal. Uh, we've made a lot of uh, impact over the years. Unfortunately, we're still a ways from that goal, but uh, we can do it. And today we're going to talk about the history of, of high-speed rail in the U.S. to some degree. Um, and come to a conclusion. Um, and that conclusion is, um, top, uh, we really need to have an executive who's in charge of making sure uh, that the project gets done, that we're gonna make the commitment to do it. it needs to be a high level executive. So in the state, it's probably the governor. Um, right now, it's the president. There's a couple of decisions he can make um, in the next year or so that can make the difference between whether we break through um, and get across the tipping point and not. Uh, so that's kind of our focusing goal is how do we get to that point? And then sub of that, there are three sub things we need or sub objectives that we have. And hopefully my presentation today will explain why I believe those are important. And those three are, one, we need to have a national plan with a national program uh, that that's, has strong leadership from the feds, uh, because this is an interstate issue, that means it's a federal issue, um, and it needs to be funded at about $20 billion a year. That's objective one. Objective two is we need to get a high-speed line running at 186 miles an hour or above, um, and that's the critical point in reaching the tipping point. Uh, because then Americans, without having a passport, can go see what this means and see that it's an American thing. And then they'll say, oh, now I get it. I want this too. And then the third goal um, is we've got to figure out how to get super frequent trains into Chicago because Chicago is the center of the, uh, and I hate saying this as the person who lives in Chicago, but it really is central to making uh, any type of train service work, whether it's freight passenger or high, uh, regional passenger or high-speed passenger, you've got to fix Chicago if you're going to do it um, in the middle of the country. Um, so those are our three objectives. Hopefully today's presentation will get there. Um, and let's get this program started. And at the end of this, um, if you... Uh, think that we've got a good mission and and you think that we want to keep this going um, chief of this if you want webinars like this to keep going uh, please go to highspeedrail.us and hit the donate button which is up in the upper left hand corner 
uh, but let's get the presentation started. And uh, first of all, I kind of explained what we're about, uh, but we do it by helping people across the country understand what high-speed rail is, what inner-city passenger rail is, why we need to do it, and what steps you can take in order to make it happen, and then giving individuals across the country the tools they can use in order to convince their state representatives and their federal representatives is, is, that this is something that we should do. Uh, the reason I'm in this, and I'm sure that folks on this call have similar um, reasons, but um, or different reasons, uh, but all kind of similar, I would imagine, um, is I'm really concerned about communities and having our communities be much stronger, uh, much healthier places to live, and the bonds be between people being much healthier. Um, and so I was in Lindbergh, Germany uh, this past September and took the train there. And just a couple of blocks away from the train is their downtown, which is a healthy, um, attractive place. And I wanted to play the sound because that accordion there, um, I love traveling around that part of Europe and everywhere you go, there's a community accordion music in the background. Um, but this town is financially stronger because you don't have to provide the infrastructure for the parking lots. There are a lot of parking lots and most of the people here probably drove, but because there's fewer of them, there's less infrastructure you have to pay for, there's less utilities you have to pay for, it's less expensive to provide uh, mail service, on and on and on because people, um, uh, because the communities are much tighter knit. So it's much, more affordable to provide high quality spaces to folks if you can make it possible to walk around. But also people are more likely to bump into each other, have those interactions that are important. Um, and high-speed rail can be a part of a big facilitator in making communities like this um, happen and make them realistic. Trains also have the advantage of you can actually talk to each other face-to-face um, as you're going very fast um, so that you can actually maintain those relationships as you're traveling. I got really engaged in this uh, because Cleveland, I grew up in Cleveland and we were able to take the train, uh, a local train um, in from the suburbs into downtown into a beautiful station and you walk out of the station and you're in the, the really, you know, the public square where the city is making a statement about what it wants to be to the rest of the world. Um, and then as you go down Euclid Street, there's a, there's a lot of shopping facilities. Um, and this being one of them, the arcade. And this is, it's a hotel now uh, with retail on the front, uh, on the first two levels and then the hotel rooms up above. But when it was opened, these were offices. So imagine the convenience um, of having your office up here, the retail down here, you can walk out to the streetcar or walk down to the train station to go to other cities elsewhere. Um, all of our cities in this country have facilities like this or assets like this that can become much stronger parts of the community if people are walking more and if there's more investment in, the, in this, this more humane way of living. Um, and then the last piece is just, again, it's the cost, both in terms of the infrastructure cost money-wise, but also in terms of the environment um, and safety. Um, you've got on the left-hand side here, a railroad that has 10 times capacity of that highway over there, if you just added one more track. Um, and uh, we cut this huge swath through the land to build that highway. There's no way that that is making um, uh, up its cost and in infrastructure from, from user fees alone. It's just too expensive to provide it. And in the process, we put that railroad out of business and now it's a museum. Um, so, but we still have a, a lot of assets like this that we can rebuild if we have key segments of high-speed line where trains are going uh, really fast. So one of our problems that we've identified is there isn't a good language to talk about what it is we want. Because there isn't this language, 
um, it makes it easy to fall into um, some really unproductive discussions. So um, ever since I've been in this, there's the, well, do we do high-speed rail or do we fix what we have? We have to do both. Um, and, you know, what is the purpose of trains? We've, we've promoted for a long time that it's, it's sh connecting short city pairs together. Now, high-speed rail excels at that, but it can do much, much more. Um, so we've created, are uh, working on a new lexicon that we call the integrated network approach. Um, and this has evolved over time. Uh, but we've come to, you know, railroads are incredibly versatile. You can put the different pieces together in different ways. So it becomes very hard to describe what high-speed rail is. And, and it's different in different countries. And it looks different in different countries and different places. Um, but in order to simplify this, we brought it down to three types of track. Um, High-speed lines, which you're building completely new infrastructure for trains running, um, let's be generous, 125 miles an hour and above. Uh, but most, a lot of lines now are being built, designed with the idea that someday you'll be going 250. There seems to be a consensus in Europe that the optimum speed is 205. China's doing a lot of high speed run or very long distance runs like Chicago to New York, the equivalent of Chicago to New York, or even the equivalent of Chicago to Miami in um, uh, Beijing to uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and so they've decided to go faster at 220 miles an hour. So high speed lines is one, only high speed trains can go on that type of track. Regional lines is this kind of gray area where you're really focused on running frequent passenger trains. Um, and we've got different examples of this around the country, but the most known is the Northeast Corridor. And then you've got shared use lines over on the left-hand side, which is where passenger trains are sharing with heavy freight trains. And that can work. And it is demonstrated to work well in Chicago on the UP line to um, Elburn and with the Union Pacific and the line with BNSF to Aurora, where they have 100 rounded, 100 trains a day, passenger trains, that pretty much run on time. Now, the, both the freight operator and the passenger operator grumble about, we wish we had our own line, but because the infrastructure is invested in properly, it works and it can work. And that's what we need to have for about 80% of the network. So regional and high speed would be about 20% of the network. Um, uh, shared use would be about 80%, but they need to work together in a network to connect the entire country. So this is our quick explanation of why. Um, so today, if we go with the philosophy of short city pairs, um, then Chicago and Indianapolis seems like a great place to start building high-speed rail. So it's 100, 200 miles, 185, 190 miles. So it's short enough that you really can, can get it done fairly quickly or you're committed to it. It's long enough that the drive is really unpleasant. Again, short enough that flying doesn't make any sense. I-65 is really crowded because of this policy failure over um, not being able to get freight trains through Chicago in a reasonable way. So you've got a lot of trucks going down on it. Um, it's a great place to build high-speed rail. The problem is, if you just look at Chicago Indianapolis, there isn't much opportunity to use that train. Now, in our current way of doing planning, which is EIS focused, as opposed to program focused, um, we've also looked at other city pairs, Chicago to Milwaukee, Chicago to Rockford. Uh, there was an effort to get to Bloomington, Indiana. Um, there are have been discussions about Chicago to Cincinnati and Chicago to Louisville. Um, and certainly there was a transit discussion again about Indianapolis to Muncie. The problem is, again, these don't give you enough ridership to really make, make it compelling. It still makes sense, but it's not compelling to get to the hourly or some or every two hours that you really need to make a, a strong dent in the market. 
Uh, so they've languished. But look what happens if you start to think about all of these as a single network where people can use the entire network. Now you've got a lot more opportunity to use the system, even if you're just going Indianapolis to Cincinnati, because there's so much more volume in the system, you can justify investments in faster trains and more frequent trains, which makes the train more useful to Indianapolis to Cincinnati. So in our lexicon, maybe in the first round, that's some sort of regional line using um, a, sh a short line that today only has a couple of trains a day, but you could rebuild it for fast and frequent trains. Maybe Indianapolis to Muncie at launch is just buses, but it's frequent buses. Milwaukee to Chicago is hourly service at an average speed of, of 60 miles an hour. Um, but in that middle now, now you can justify building the high speed line so that you take what today is a five and a half hour trip, but should be about a three to three and a half hour trip on, on a shared use line. You can take that down to 90 minutes with a train every hour and sometimes every half. And now you've cut 90 minutes off the Milwaukee to Cincinnati trip. Um, so we really have to think about this in networks. The FRA has started that with three regional plans, um, one based around Chicago, one based around Atlanta, um, and one in the Southwest. Um, we really need to take that that um, to the national level. We need the FRA to take that up to the national level, and we need the states to really be thinking about what their role is so that the FRA provides the big picture context with the, just the trunk lines, the states provide the, the context to the smaller towns, and then the local MPOs or metropolitan planning organizations provide the context within their area. Um, so California is the first to do this. They've done a couple of really important things. Uh, they started in 1990 with a huge investment in their shared use program. Uh, so they've got Amtrak service that runs 16 trains a day on two routes, um, and they're building towards 10 trains a day in the Central Valley. Uh, they built commuter rail systems from scratch, light rail systems from scratch, and very importantly, they have frequent buses that meet the trains so that um, you're serving a lot of communities, not just rail served, because the buses provide that service, and it's all on one ticket. So they started that program in 1990. In 1990, they formed a high-speed rail commission, um, which provided the uh, political case for building, for creating a high-speed rail authority. Uh, they put that authority together in the mid-90s. Um, and then that authority provided uh, the base case for um, ha going to the voters with a bond issue. Unfortunately, Governor Schwarzenegger delayed that bond issue until 2008, delaying the project. Uh, but it did get, end up being passed by a majority of the, the uh, voters in 2008. Now, the Schwarzenegger administration also did something uh, to hobble the program at that point, which was so they're going out to the voters with um, with a big bond issue. Um, and they're about to apply for billions of dollars in federal money to supplement that, and they don't fund the authorities' um, infrastructure, people infrastructure in order to do the actual work that needs to be done when they get that money. So this comes back to that theme of the executive has to be committed to the project and take some hard decisions in order to make it work. So in 2008, they weren't sure they were going to have the money, but in 2008, they needed to staff up the authority in order to implement the project if they did it. So that was a political risk that the Schwarzenegger administration needed to take. They didn't go in the direction that led it to be successful. One th mistake that they made that we can learn from is they did the two in isolation. Um, and in fact, they even did Amtrak and commuter rail in isolation. But in 2018, they brought it all together and they said, this is how this whole thing works as a system. So, in, and this is a, a representation of that. And so their long-term goal is to bring this together as a system where you can use the entire thing with a single ticket. And then you're really truly connecting the entire state together. 
And that piece in the middle in the Central Valley, which is under construction, is the piece that really gets you across the tipping point on making it work because you take that middle segment from three hours down to 90 minutes. So it makes everything easier to do. California's challenge is their hardest part is getting through the mountains. Um, we really need the legislature to step up and say, we're gonna move forward with those mountain passes. Um, and that's a project that really needs to get happening is, again, the legislature and the governor need to say, we're not sure where the money's gonna come from to do it, but if we're ever gonna get the money, we've gotta to commit to doing it now. Um, and again, it comes back to that leadership issue. Are we going to do this or are we not? Um, so I talked about the federal program and the federal plan. Um, in my view, when people ask, um, um, how do we make this happen? Or not how do we make this happen? We say, well, what should be connected at the federal level? And I say, if it's important enough to have an interstate highway there, it's important enough to have a federal high frequency train there. Now, that doesn't mean we're building a new high speed line, but it certainly means that we've got high frequency on time service. And we do it in such a way that allows more freight to move uh, by trains um, um, as well. Um, and uh, there is a good map out there that we will share in, in, a, uh, in a different program uh, that lays out probably where the high speed line should be in this. Uh, but essentially it's a triangle from St. Paul to Miami, uh, Chicago to Boston and New York. Um, uh, I'm missing a couple of pieces in there and then um, a couple of lines radiating out from uh, LA along the coast up in Washington in a triangle down in Texas. So we're coming back to its commitment. Right. So the technology is easy once you have the commitment. Um, so we got to talk about the 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 um, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, I'm distracted by your question. Well, the, the key I'll, uh, Mark is asking, uh, what do we need to do good Indiana and Missouri on board? And we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so. The, the key is the culture and whether you have leadership that's willing to take chances and make things work. Um, and I love this locomotive, it looks great. Um, it's exciting to think about in 1942, there was a steam locomotive that could go 125 miles an hour and did, um, even though it was pulling um, antique old heavy passenger cars uh, behind it. Uh, but it really represents a huge mistake in terms of um, what the railroads were thinking. So if you go back to 1934, they had already demonstrated a number of railroads in the West that a different car design where you're focusing on lightweight cars, where you bring the train together in an articulated unit, you reduce the cost of running that train. It can get in and out of stations faster. It's safer. It's much more comfortable for the passengers. Um, um, and key being, and so there's the, all these reasons why we should have a different type of train. But the Pennsylvania Railroad even researched those and decided not to do it because it wasn't to them worth the risk. So they went with the old thing where they could run faster locomotives with the old expensive cars um, and they didn't really think about it. The other thing that you have to do is change your business model in order to run trains like this. So again, that's a commitment from the executives of the company to say, we're going to have a different business model and the railroads weren't willing to do this and we lost these lessons during World War II. But fortunately, the lessons were relearned in Europe. So if you take this train where the, the, low, the engine itself is at the front, um, and if instead, and there's just one cab, so it can only go one direction, if you put the uh, engine in the middle and you put cabs at both ends, um, then you basically, and you use more modern materials in the process, you've basically got a direct descendant of the pioneers after the M10,000, et cetera. Um, and these train types of trains like this have started to run in Texas and California. 
Um, And then I just, um, on the side in the 50s, there was a guy uh, who was trying to learn all of these lessons and come up with the uh, what he believed would be the ideal train set for North American operation. Um, his second prototype was the Explorer. Um, and um, it led to the UA Turbo Train, which was the third prototype. Uh, but one of the, the key things to point out here was you really have to keep the, the train set itself low so that you can go around turns faster. Um, and that was the one of the things with he did with the Explorer. Um, this also parts of the learning that he had in this are in the Talgo trains that are running in a number of countries across the uh, world, plus uh, the two remaining Talgos up in uh, Washington. So in order to do shared use right, we've got to think differently about rolling stock. We have to think differently about the business model. We've got to launch with high frequency service. Um, we've got to work with the freight railroads as partners, thinking about how we make freight work better in the process. Um, there's a lot of things we need to do there. Um, and the key example of how to put that all together um, is Brightline and Florida. And I talked about how we need Americans to be able to ride high-speed trains that, uh, uh, and the idea of having a very high-quality, high-frequent train um, at L Orlando Airport, so people can fly all around the country to Orlando Airport and take that train to Miami. I think that's going to be um, a real game changer and, and really start think getting the country thinking differently about what trains um, should be. But I want to go back to Japan um, in the first country that put it all together in terms of what, how you change the business model, how you change the infrastructure, um, and making a strong commitment to do it. So in the mid '50s, um, the Japan Japan had a big problem. Nobody wanted to run uh, the Japanese National Railroad uh, because everybody knew that. Just like the United States, when Japan got wealthy, they were going to switch from trains to cars. Um, and so because that was a government entity, why would why would an aspiring young up and comer want to go work for the railroad, which was dying? Um, so fortunately, they were able to find an experienced railroad professional named Shinji Sogo, um, who as his last job, actually after retirement, they called him out of retirement, he took the job. And um, uh, Japan had been working on building a new railroad linking Tokyo to Osaka, uh, but, and it even started pre-World War II, but had given up on that program. And uh, the leadership in the operations department, et cetera, was strongly opposed to it. So what he did was he created a separate unit, separate from the institutional infrastructure of the organization that was in charge of building the new main line, um, which in Japanese is Shinkansen. Um, and he spent a lot of his personal energy personally lobbying the diet in order to get the money to build it. Um, and so it's highly possible that if it weren't for this man's efforts and commitment to making it happen, we wouldn't have high-speed rail the way that we have high-speed rail. Um, so, of course, because uh, the guy who makes things happen a lot of times isn't recognized at the time it was happening, um, he was uh, given a seat in the back row of the bleachers at the inauguration. Uh, but they did put this plaque in, um, uh, they did recognize later about the importance of his leadership. And now you can go see his plaque in uh, Japan, uh, Tokyo Central Station. Um, so they had an advantage because they were, oh, and then, so we know that in 1964, it opened up an entirely way, a different way of thinking about uh, 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 how passenger trains should work. Um, and so in the early 70s, they committed to connecting the entire 
uh, of the, the entirety of the three main islands together with a single um, high-speed rail network. And you can see how that grew over time. This is actually out of date. There's a couple of missing pieces in this. Um, but I want to point out, this is out of date. So this just opened this past uh, uh, past September. Um, and I got to ride that in November, which was really exciting. Um, this opened uh, about five years ago through the tunnel. Uh, but again, it's not all or nothing. So Japan had the, the advantage of being able to do completely from scratch, which we'll talk about in a minute. But there's also some flexibility there. So there are two lines where uh, uh, the Central, the Eastern Railroad decided instead to rebuild the existing line to what we would call regional standards so that they could run the high-speed trains on those routes. Uh, so there's a train that can go uh, 205 miles an hour on the main line and is going off into the country, but they built the infrastructure on the, they, it's not a shared use line like we would have in this country. And the other thing is they built a dual gauge so that freight trains could get through the tunnel um, shared with the high-speed trains going through the tunnel um, uh, to the Northern Island there. Um, so again, it's versatility, but it's the commitment to do it. So you had SOGO being committed to making the first line work, and then you had the country as a whole being committed to connect the whole country um, in the early 70s and understanding it was going to happen over time just like we committed to the second national highway program in 1956 um, and knew that, it, but it was gonna connect the entire country and we knew it would take a lot of time to do it. But because they started from scratch, they could do a couple of key things. Um, and let's see if the video uh, works. Um, so they, could start with level boarding, and you'll see why level boarding is so important in this video. It means you can get a train into and out of the station. It means that um, uh, wheelchair users can get on and off easier. You don't have to deal with luggage. You don't have people falling downstairs, which happens frequently on, on trains with stairs. Um, but this video here, this train pulls in and pulls out transferring hundreds of people in just to, and actually having a crew change in just two minutes. So level boarding is critical and because they started from scratch, they could do that easily. The other is because it's separate from the other network, the trains can be incredibly light. Uh, so they're much lighter than European trains because the European trains go off onto the existing network. So that means you can build the infrastructure um, less expensively. And again, you're burning less energy and the trains can accelerate faster with less energy. Um, so they could put the whole piece together. And then the most important thing is they could create a new business model because it's completely separate infrastructure. Um, so this was a huge advantage that um, may work in places in the US. I um, mean, we need to figure out where it can work and, and make it happen. Uh, but again, this is less than, this is about two and a half minutes. Uh, with this train pulling in and out. Uh, you can see the person down there uh, signaling that the doors are going to close. Uh, the doors start closing. The train, the doors are closing. The train starts pulling out. And then as we turn around, now that, so this train, you know, we talk about cities that are close together. This train probably goes farther than Chicago to Memphis or Chicago to New York. I haven't measured it. But there's the engineer. So they had a full crew change at this point. And there's the engineering engineer uh, recognizing the new, the new crew as the train leaves. Uh, so uh, it's really exciting to go look at this and experience it. And uh, you have to, one of the key things though in this business model is the passengers have to recognize how to get on and off the train. And it's interesting to watch American passengers muck it up. But uh, so we've got 
this was really the key to make high-speed rail work in the world, was that initial Tokyo to Osaka. So that's our second objective. We need to get to 186 miles an hour by 2030. Um, and for a variety of reasons, and we talked about what happened during this Schwarzenegger administration, um, the, the piece that's probably ready to go the soonest um, is Brightline West. And there's a couple of decisions that the Biden administration can make in order to expedite this. So we need the commitment to make it happen coming from the Biden administration to make it work. And again, I believe if we can get this train running in this decade, this will be the tipping point where it allows us to actually start investing in trains. We need to point out that one of those things we need to do now is start investing heavily in the infrastructure needed to build the supply chain for rolling stock. So that's been a key frustration is we don't have a solid supply chain in order to supply rolling stock at an ongoing basis. Um, and that's something the Biden administration can do some administrative actions on um, in order to make that work quicker. Um, so three countries said we're motivated to do something. Um, and those three countries were the US, the Italy, and France. Um, and they were motivated by the Tokyo Osaka success story to we're going to do something. So the US was the first to hit the ground running. Um, about a year after it opened, Lyndon Johnson signed the High Speed Ground Transportation Act. Um, and for a slide, I probably took too much out here. I just like this thing that I keep hearing. We 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 have this same tired and inadequate, inadequate mass transportation we had 30 years ago. Um, and the key piece though here is this bill is a first step toward accomplishing some of those objectives. So that doesn't sound like a strong commitment to me. That sounds like we're gonna put our toe in the water and figure out what's gonna work. Um, so it wasn't a big enough program uh, to get over the tipping point. Um, it was focused on one small region of the country, not the whole country, um, but we have to thank Senator Pell for his strong efforts to make this happen. Um, and if it weren't for Senator Pell in the act of 1965, maybe we wouldn't have passenger trains that connect the rest of the country together. Um, so we have to recognize that this was progress, but coming back to our, if we need strong executive commitment to make this happen, this probably wasn't there. But we did do two important things. The first was, and these were the two goals of the program, we got trains operating at 125 miles an hour by 1969, didn't put enough money into the infrastructure to make sure it would be reliable, but we made it happen. Um, and despite the fact that that was, uh, they had two companies building um, uh, basically the same design um, and from scratch, it was a new train design that didn't exist before. Um, and we got it out in, in a very short period of time. Uh, so that's that's huge progress that we need to celebrate and probably saved passenger inner city passenger rail in this country. The other was we were the first to build the first high speed train. Um, if you define that as going faster than 150 miles an hour. Uh, so Japan uh, launched. I've heard two different things. I've heard 125 and I've heard 135. I believe that what happened was they designed it for 135 and then to get the World Bank loan, the World Bank made them drop it down to 125 miles an hour. But we designed a train and built it here in Chicago uh, that was able to go 170 miles an hour. And it did it with reporters on board. It did not, they didn't do it as a separate thing. They, they actually had reporters on board. And I've heard, that if the crew wanted to get home, uh, they would run at that pretty close to that fast with passengers on board um, towards the uh, in the late 60s after it was in operation. But a lot of innovation in this train set that we kind of forgot. But this is a direct descendant of that Explorer train, 
which is then a descendant of train X. Um, and so um, we there was a lot learned in this that we need to go back and go, okay, so what did we learn about this and what, what do we need to regain? Um, one key point is this hit in uh, on the demonstration run between uh, Toronto and Montreal, it hit a uh, fully loaded semi um, at 100 miles an hour with no injuries and it stayed on the track. Um, so one of the things that we have done in this country is we've decided that big and heavy is required for safety. And there's actually a strong case to be made that big and heavy actually makes it less safe for the passengers. And that's a whole other webinar and a future subject. So we did a lot of good in a very short period of time. Um, and it probably, again, was very important progress. But the, the second country that did something was Italy. They built the first high-speed line in Europe. They opened that in the late 70s, but they didn't change their business model around that high-speed line, so nobody remembers that it happened. The third one was France, and the French National Railroad recognized that they were going to go out of business if they didn't figure out how to do something different. Their uh, customer base was dropping quickly as a result of people changing to the automobile. And they recognized they had to do something very different in order to make that happen. So again, it comes back to that co commitment to have a different business model in order to really change the experience for the customer. The first step was uh, a turbine powered train that went nearly 200 miles an hour in 1972. That was the test bed that led to the uh, uh, full production TGV. And to be clear, TGV, if you translate it to, uh, uh, I can't pronounce the French words, but if you translate it, it's uh, uh, high speed train, right? So that makes it easy. So the key difference was they built a new high-speed line and they did it differently than Japan did and they did it differently than we are able to do it, but it's a key learning lesson here. So they had already invested heavily in electrification and speeding up their core routes. Um, so they were already doing hundred and plus on a lot of their main lines uh, before they were there with electrified trains and they don't have heavy long freight trains like we do. So they were able to open up a short segment in the middle, which then allowed them with a train that if you'll look here, looks very much like that M10,000 that I talked about at the beginning, low slung, articulated, double-ended, and in this case, powered by overhead wire. Um, so because that train was able to go very fast on the high-speed line, um, which in French is shortened to LGV, um, and also perform much better on what they call classic lines or what in our new lexicon is called regional lines. And so they were able to take a trip of Paris to Marseille, which is Chicago to Pittsburgh or Chicago to Memphis, and see, before that, um, it was down to under uh, seven hours for that trip, which today is about 12 hours, 11 hours or 12 hours by Amtrak. They were able to take it down from seven uh, to five with these two segments of high-speed line plus the improvements that you get out of the TV, TV train. The other issue is they were able to serve an entire region with better train service because of the flexibility of those trains. So this wasn't Paris to Lyon. This was Paris to the Southeast. Um, and that's a really key thing to keep in mind. And it goes back to that network discussion. How do you make this work for a lot of people together? And I can see that I am going very long. I hope that I'm, I'm holding you, but we're almost done. Um, so that's what allowed the country or the world to really take off with high-speed rail. Um, Again, China was com fully committed to airplanes and the automobile, um, but there was the head of the ministry who I believe, I've not been able to prove it, uh, but he basically 
said, don't worry about it. I'm only designing for 125 miles an hour. Don't worry about it. So he designed a network. And then they had a big snowstorm in early 2008 during spring festival. So if you take Thanksgiving weekend for us and multiply it by 10, that spring festival, they had a, a snowstorm that shut down the highways and the airports. Um, and then they had they needed a make work program because of the um, uh, recession that was impending. So Minister of Railroads, and again, I can't prove this story. I believe it to be true. Minister of the Railroads walks in and he says, look, I've got this program. Uh, we're going to deal with the problem with snow. We're going to put a lot of people to work and we're going to make you rich in the process. Um, so he was able to get the first high speed line in operation for the Olympics in 2008. That proved the case and they committed to high speed rail connecting the entire country. And that's that hockey stick that you see is, is China moving forward. Um, and so the last piece of this, um, so objective one, um, national plan with money. Objective two is high speed line on operation in this decade. Objective three is figure out Chicago and get regional lines built into Chicago. Um, we've got a challenge. The four lines that work best, which are in green here, uh, for converting to regional rail um, are not the lines that go to Union Station and they don't go to O'Hare. Um, so if I were in charge, the states would be working quickly to start running much more frequent service into Ogilvy Station uh, from Madison and Milwaukee. Um, let's get that service going. Um, I'd also be saying, let's run more frequent service to Peoria, which has none, to Moline, which has none, into um, to, uh, St. Louis, into LaSalle Street, and more frequent service to Champaign and to Detroit, into, into uh, Millennium. Uh, but really what we need to do is figure out how to get trains through Chicago and to O'Hare. So um, we came up with a proposal called Crossrail Chicago, which is there in pink, which links these lines together um, in various ways. Um, and this will be something that we'll be rolling out very shortly. Um, and let's see if I can make the switch. And I will give you a preview of how we are going to roll that out. Um, here we go. High Speed Rail has been proven worldwide to build connections between communities and bring people together. Fast, frequent, and affordable trains would transform travel in the U.S., helping improve the economies of thousands of cities and towns. The Federal Railroad Administration has identified several future high-speed lines that would meet in Chicago. They would host hundreds of trains per day through the city, across the Midwest, and beyond. But Chicago has a problem. New tracks to separate passenger trains from freight trains are needed on several key routes. The good news is that great corridors already exist, but new connections are needed for them to work together. We have a vision for uniting these valuable corridors into a high-capacity travel network. We call it Crossrail Chicago. Fast, frequent trains would use Crossrail to link the entire Midwest to Chicago, O'Hare Airport, and McCormick Place. This amazing system would simultaneously serve multiple travel markets, including visitors to Chicago, international travelers at O'Hare, and commuters within the metro area. The impact of Crossrail would be staggering, offering thousands of new travel connections. It starts with fixing Union Station. Major improvements would expand capacity and enhance your travel experience. New through tracks and platforms would unite north and south routes out of Union Station into a continuous corridor. A new interior walkway could unite Union Station with Ogilvy Transportation Center to take advantage of great routes to Madison and Milwaukee. 
With further enhancements, trains on those corridors could directly serve Union Station, providing even more route options north and south. Upgraded track, electrification, state-of-the-art trains, and elimination of road and rail grade crossings would vastly increase the line's capacity, speed, and reliability. The cornerstone of Crossrail is the Crosstown Connector, a new ramp and bridge from the St. Charles Airline into Union Station, and a new connection to the Rock Island Line. Crossrail could be one of the most important pieces of transportation infrastructure in the country, supporting hundreds of trains per day and millions of passenger trips per year. It would allow through-running trains from destinations south and east of Chicago to destinations north and west. It would help speed travelers from anywhere in the Midwest straight to O'Hare. And it would be the foundation for new services, including fast regional and commuter trains arriving every 10 minutes, express trains across the city, and airport trains from the Loop and McCormick Place. There would be hundreds of new convenient trips, like River Grove to Sox Park, University of Chicago to Lake Forest, and Norwood Park to Tinley Park. Crossrail would generate new business and employment opportunities, connecting the south side with jobs in the business corridors to the northwest. It would make travel faster, easier, and save everyone's time. The economic benefits of Crossrail and high-speed rail would be dramatic, reaching every city and town on the network, bringing more travelers to those places and pulling them all closer together. Crossrail absolutely should happen. Get involved and help us make sure it does happen. So uh, to be clear, that is a draft. Um, it, uh, uh, there's some refinements that, that if you look at it, uh, need to be made uh, and we're in the process of getting those done. So that'll roll out in the next uh, several weeks. Uh, but we're really excited about that. Um, I wanna point out that Amtrak has reapplied for its uh, uh, Chicago Hub Improvement Program. Um, and they went a little bit bigger than the last time, uh, which we're very happy about. Um, and hopefully they can uh, get that funding from the feds and move forward in, in doing that in a way that's consistent with, with electrified trains running very frequently in the future. Uh, so we do have progress on that, very big progress. Um, I would be um, happy to take any questions. Um, and uh, Mark, your question was, uh, the Illinois executive is on board. How we, do we get Indiana and Missouri executives on board, meaning the governors? Um, and that's true. What we need to do in all states is we need to work together uh, to find local advocates in all of the towns that will benefit from passenger rail and get them to persuade their governors to get involved and then persuade those governors, I'm sorry, mayors and county executives, and then get those mayors and county executives to push on uh, the state capitals in order to put together programs. And it's not hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Uh, states, states need to be thinking bigger than that. It's not, um, <coughs> excuse me. So it's this bubble up philosophy that, that we're a key part in helping to make that happen. Um, and Kyle is asking, what is the current progress of the um, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati corridor? Um, and the state has submitted a uh, application to become part of the corridor ID program. So uh, the FRA is working to create a new uh, pipeline of projects so that as funding is available, they've got a clear stream of projects to fund in a, a, a focused way. Um, and that's the corridor ID program. The first round of creating that program was that uh, states and municipalities could put their corridor in um, in order to be part of the program. Again, 
a huge step in the right direction, but it's corridor focused, not network focused, but it's a huge step in the right direction. So the state of Ohio did apply to be part of that program. Uh, what needs to happen is those mayors need to take a strong leadership role in saying, we want this to be a truly competitive system with those cities are probably big enough that the plan should be to get to hourly service. How you do that, we don't know yet, but that's the point of the quarter ID program. So let's let's work with those mayors and state representatives to push on the state to think about hourly service on that corridor. Um, and Richard, we don't have a link yet to the Crossrail video because it's not done. Look for that in our emails in the next several weeks. Um, and Kirk is asking, how did uh, uh, European high-speed rail systems deal with providing through service with their multiple terminals in large cities? Do they have something like Crossrail? The answer is yes and no. So um, France decided uh, they have tunnels underneath the city, uh, but they're focused on their regional trains, not on high-speed trains. So some of the high-speed trains go into the city center um, at multiple stations, and some go around and go via the airport. So that's how they dealt with that. Um, Frankfurt hasn't dealt with it yet. They have one big station called uh, 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 in Frankfurt. Uh, Munich built a tunnel underneath to connect their stations. Um, Spain has not one, not two, but three tunnels connecting their two main stations. So they originally had four, they narrowed it down to three, uh, I'm sorry, they narrowed it down to two main stations that are connected by three tunnels. Um, and then there's examples like that throughout the um, throughout the world. The interesting thing is Tokyo doesn't. So because they have different electrification systems east and west of Tokyo, the trains can't, aren't compatible. Uh, so they actually have two separate section areas for the high-speed trains to the west and the high-speed trains to the east. So again, it's not one size fits all. You take your existing assets, you figure out what to do the best with that. Um, and yes, Mark, Brightline, Florida is, is the model for the three C, or the, the, I can't say it that way, but the Cleveland, uh, Cincinnati corridor. And the key thing is the relationship with the Florida East Coast Railroad and the agreements they have around dispatching trains, um, and infrastructure investment. Um, that's that institutional piece that really makes a huge difference there. Um, and it seems to be driven largely by Wes Eden's desire to run good passenger trains around the country and making sure that that process worked right. And again, it comes back to the executive and figuring out how to make things work. Um, unfortunately, they're both private companies, so we don't know what the bargain is between the railroad, um, the two railroads the Florida East Coast, which owns the tracks and has the freight trains. And then um, what um, All Aboard Florida is the official name of the railroad that runs the trains. So it's not public, um, but we have some guesses, but it's important because that's probably what you need, the arrangement you need to have with Union Pacific at all. And we got close on the Chicago to St. Louis corridor um, and hopefully soon there will be a blog post that explains what that is. Um, so Dylan, are there questions in chat that I should be looking at? Um, or are they? Yeah, there was one question about um, what can we do to get passenger rail to Moline? Uh, so, um, so the key problem with Moline, if we're to really simplify the issue, it's more complicated than this, but, but because we need simplified issues, um, it boils down to, does the state pay to rebuild the old Rock Island Bridge over the Rock River, which probably needs replaced in any case? I argue, yes, we need to do that. 
And it needs to be part of a commitment from the Iowa interstate to get to a train every two hours to Moline and to Peoria. Um, so yes, we need to push on the state to find the resources to replace that bridge and do other things, do it as soon as possible, um, and then move forward on thinking big around the entire Rock Island corridor. What the immediate term is, the governor needs to get engaged in figuring out how to make that happen in the short term. Uh, same thing with Rockford. Uh, the governor needs to make an, uh, a key decision uh, on how to move forward. So again, we need to pressure the governor to make that happen. Um, and there's a question in here that can this be funded by ticket sales? The answer is no. Um, and the reason for that is um, we have financed our um, highway network, the main com competition, um, with so many streams of funding that are independent of uh, the person who actually decides whether to drive or not, that it is completely unreasonable to think that you would build new infrastructure entirely on ticket sales. Um, and I want to point out, Kirk is saying that uh, Salt Lake City is a very important example um, and we hope to have some content on why that's an important uh, situation in the future. Um, and uh, Phil is saying that Philadelphia SEPTA system um, is a good example of the infrastructure piece. Um, I would like to see them really amp up their um, efforts on the business side in order to make it much more attractive and much more understandable to passengers. Uh, is there anything else, Dylan, that we should cover here? I think the last one was just a question about our ability to lobby as an organization. Um, so, yes, we can lobby uh, to a limited degree, um, and we have done that in the past. Um, we um, have uh, a couple of key wins that happened because of that in reverse order are we create, we persuaded the legislature to create the Illinois High Speed Railway Commission, which just launched a couple of uh, months ago. Um, and we hope we'll create the master plan like California has that combines all these systems together. Um, and uh, so there is a limited amount of lobbying that we can do with, with legal restrictions. So I want to thank you again for um, hopefully this was a cohesive presentation. I want to thank those who are members for being members. If you're not a member or if you really enjoyed this presentation and you want to keep this going, um, you can, if you choose, type in hsrail, and I'm going to type this in here now, hsrail.org slash swag, um, or go to our main website and search on the term swag, and we've got polos with a small logo, we've got t-shirts with a small logo, and we've got new t-shirts on the way that have a big logo, um, and hats and some other cool posters and such. Please make a, a, an additional donation or join us. And most importantly, get your friends engaged um, so that we can grow this movement across the country. We need to get a lot more members engaged in other states around the country. Um, and so um, um, thank you again for being a member and please go to hsreal.org and make a donation. And feel free to call us with if we didn't answer your questions um, or you want to provide feedback. Um, we'd be happy to engage with you uh, as we move forward. So thanks again. And uh, look forward to a rest of an exciting train day for you all. Goodbye.